We're going live. Hello, 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 my friends. Jill Osborne from the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, July 9th. Believe it or not, I've actually been trying to start this stream for the last 30 minutes, but my main streaming computer is dying. And uh, I'm amazed that it decided that it wanted to work. I think I know what I'm going to have to by myself for my birthday next week, which is another computer, another streaming computer. Anyway, my purpose in doing these meetings is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can mess with you again. I don't want anybody telling you that IC is all in your head. I don't want anybody telling you that you're, you have an incurable bladder disease because, of course, that's what uh, doctors have told patients for many, many years, and now we know that that's simply not true, that IC is a neuromuscular disorder for the vast majority of patients. I want you to carry hope in your heart. I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that we're here and we care. We are here for you. The IC network is has been providing IC support for 30 years. Hi, Gay. Hi, Peggy. Can you believe it? 30 years. This is my 30 year anniversary of being a support group leader. It's crazy. I was such a young kid back then because clearly I'm only 45 now. <laughs> yeah, not exactly true. <laughs> um, if you don't know me, I uh, bring to you uh, a lot of experience with this. I'm a published author uh, on IC. I do research. We do a lot of research right now. My research has been presented at National Institutes of Health meetings. Uh, we did a very large study with the Elmeron eye issue. Uh, we're now doing a large study on Elmeron inflammatory bowel disease issue. So if you come on over to the IC Network website and go into our survey center, you could, or actually go to our blog that talks about it, you can take that survey. Um, and I just have a bunch of degrees because I'm a geek. So normally when I do these meetings, I usually do about a 15, 20 minute little riff, depending upon the issues of the day. Um, and, um, and then I'm happy to take your questions for as long as you have questions for me. If you don't, we're fine, we're done. I'm gonna have to go down and uh, look at some new computer equipment sooner rather than later. So interestingly, um, Oh, there's a squirrel. We have a squirrel nest in the tree right next to my office. <laughs> we have just had a very, very large IC conference in New York City. And it was really, it's done by the European Society for the Study of IC and Bladder Pain Syndrome. Um, it was just apparently a fantastic, excuse me, a, fa <laughs> a fantastic conference. I did not go because I have been recovering from COVID and a very, very bad cold and of course the death of my parents. And so I just haven't been strong enough. I'm still not, I think I'm about 60% of back to normal. Maybe we'll see. Um, but it did raise kind of an important issue. And we've been discussing this among the international patient groups. You know, one of the really exciting things now is that 30 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of support and collaboration in, internationally between the patient groups. Now we have a really good support network and it's very comforting to me to know that when I'm not available, so many other uh, advocates are attending conferences, talking about it, et cetera, et cetera. And the issue that's coming up right now, and I, I really have to talk to my friend Jane, who's the president of the International Painful Bladder Foundation over in the Netherlands, is that in Europe, I see is considered a rare disease. In America, it is considered a common pelvic pain condition. And there is some discussion right now. There's going to be some very important meetings um, happening about how do we introduce I see to newly diagnosed patients? What should we be saying? What should we not be saying? What messages do you need to hear? What messages are counterproductive? And one of the things that I, I contributed to that discussion is that I think we need to stop telling patients they have an incurable bladder disease. Because that's what our national guidelines say, that there's no disease process happening in the vast majority of bladders of patients diagnosed with interstitial cystitis. That for most of us, it appears to be a neuromuscular disorder. So in Europe, this is considered rare. 
in America, this is considered very common. And the question is why? And I was thinking about this last night as there was a little discussion online and and this morning. And I and I think that's because Europeans. Well, let's see. How do I want to say this? I want to say that Europeans do a better diagnostic workup and they don't consider an I, I see a grab bag diagnosis. Whereas I think in America, if a doctor can't figure out why you have frequency urgency or pain, they just throw it out. Ah, you got interstitial cystitis. Here's the diet. Here's some Omeron I'll see you in six months without really finessing that diagnostic process. And I think in Europe, although Europe has lots of problems too with caring for patients and lack of treatments and all that other stuff like that, I suspect that, and I might be wrong, and I'm going to try to talk to Jane about it this week. I think that in Europe, if a patient is diagnosed with uh, pelvic floor tension, they are, in, they are immediate, immediately excluded from a diagnosis of interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome. We also want to say that in Europe, interstitial, so the diagnosis of interstitial cystitis only applies to patients with Hunter's lesions. Everybody else who has symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, who does not have Hunter's lesions, they're diagnosed with bladder pain syndrome. So maybe that's what they do that's so much better than what we do here in the United States. Um, because it is very true. Hunter's lesions is its own unique disease or condition. If you have bleeding wounds in your bladder and you've been diagnosed with Hunter's lesions, we've all known for 20 years. You are in your own unique patient group. You have your own biopsy results and pathology findings. We know that there's massive inflammation happening in the center of a, in, in those lesions. Uh, we now suspect, I mean, we have good research that shows that some Hunter's lesions are caused by viral infections. That's a disease, a virus is a disease. We also know that for, so for some others, Hunter's lesions can be the result of severe, severe neuroinflammation. Is that a disease? Well, if that's a result of extremely tight pelvic floor muscles, eh, it's hard to say. Anyway, um, so we have some very clear work that we have to do internationally. Um, is the European perspective correct? Is the American perspective correct? Or maybe it's the Japanese that have it correct. Because what the Japanese call a lot of this is hypersensitive bladder syndrome. And that really applies to IC subtype 5 central sensitization. So anyway, uh, hopefully I will be able to get some notes from other people who attended the conference. Um, hopefully they'll have some recordings and I'll be able to give you a summary from it, Jane. If you ever go to painful bladder, I think it's painful-bladder.org. That's Jane's website. Um, she doesn't provide patient support. She's more um, a researcher, um, but she has a fabulous newsletter where she gives all the updates uh, from all the conferences and you can sign up to receive her newsletter. It's very, very good. I read it religiously every time it comes out. I would encourage you to support her if you can. Um, anyway, so that's like the one thing that's going on. They did have some new research that was presented. I'm writing up that research right now for our newsletter. And there was one study that really caught my attention. And I think that study is worth talking about again. And that is that we have um, an kind of an original or timely double, pl double blind placebo controlled study from Italy on the use of aloe as a therapy for patients with interstitial cystitis, but we have to remember their definition of interstitial cystitis might be different than ours. Anyway, uh, patients took 3,600 uh, uh, milligrams a day for four months, 
And the symptom that was the most uh, well affected and improved was nighttime urination, nocturia. The symptom that did not improve was urgency. So that's so interesting. To me, I, I find the mechanics of that very, very interesting. I'd like to understand that a little bit more. Um, however, what they also showed is that in general, the symptoms, overall symptoms improved, quality of life improved. And so this is great. You know, we have been using aloe in the ICU world for 20, 25 years. It's very nice to have another study, this one from Europe, showing that it can have some effect. And so uh, I find that the patients who, who do the best with aloe are the patients who seem to be flaring a little bit more. And uh, if you're interested in more, come on over to the IC Network website and go into our shop. The aloe that we have that I really like now um, is called Aloe Path, which I think I have a bottle right here. Yeah, Aloe Path. Aloe is soothing. Just as aloe is soothing to a sunburn uh, on your skin, aloe can be soothing to the bladder. Um, the reason why I like this specific formula now is because it combines aloe with PEA. So it kind of enhances that soothing effect. We've got the superficial soothing effect of the skin from the aloe combined with the nerve calming effect of the PEA. So I think uh, aloe path is, would be a very, very interesting experiment if you wanted to give it a shot. Uh, but I'm not here to sell you stuff. I don't wanna sell you stuff. I wanna talk to you about IC. So um, the other thing that I was that I wanted to talk to you about is now that it's summertime and it's warm, praise God, hallelujah, it's warm here in California. It's been so cold here. It's ridiculous. There's a great quote. The coldest winter I ever spent is a summer in San Francisco. Man, when that fog kicks in, ah, it's like 50 degrees and the furnace turns on. And we've been dealing with fog for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it's sunny now. It's going to be 100 today, maybe. I hope so. But it's time to move again. It's time to exercise again. I was working with a patient on Friday who um, literally was afraid to move. She was, af she was afraid to walk out of her house. She was afraid to eat. She was afraid to go to the doctor. She was, she was just consumed by fear. And... Um, and that makes sense. Who hasn't been consumed by fear when you're struggling with severe pain? And her case was very, 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 very complex. Um, but ultimately, in the end, it came down to the fact that she had extreme estrogen atrophy. Her doctor told her that. But she didn't understand how estrogen would make it better. She tried estrogen, it burned, she stopped using it. So her skin got drier and drier and drier. So we know we've got extreme estrogen atrophy and then she had extremely tight pelvic floor muscles. Hi, Mary. Hi, Ariella. Thank you for telling everybody about the IC network. I really appreciate that very, very, very much. And hi, YouTube, we're, we're simulcasting um, on Facebook and YouTube. So if I'm looking here, I'm looking at Facebook and I'm, lo I'm looking over here, I'm looking at YouTube. So hello, YouTube. So anyway, she also, hi, Donna. Hey, girl. She also had very tight pelvic floor muscles. But she wasn't connecting the dots. She kept saying, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Please help me. I don't know what to do. And I said, okay, number one, we're going to take a nice deep breath, couple of deep breaths here. Let's just whoo, breathe it in, breathe it out. Let's get some oxygen in to try to help calm some of that anxiety. And I, what I did is I broke it down into very simple steps for her. Right? Okay. So nobody expects you to solve this in a day. It's impossible to solve your pelvic pain in a day. Hello, Valeria from Slovakia. Nice to meet you. Um, so she had all the symptoms, Mary. She had frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, pain with movement, pain with walking, sciatica-like pain, pain down her legs, numbness in her leg. 
She had numbness in her legs, numbness in her feet. Okay. So, and again, she was just spinning in a circle. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. She hadn't been able to put it into kind of a, a, a logical sequence of steps. And so that's what we tried to do. So in her steps, the first thing that I needed to her to do was to read about menopause. Because literally, like 90% of her symptoms were very clear menopause. She was in her 50s. So she had uh, hot flashes. She had periods of intense anxiety. She had very itchy skin. Um, uh, she had breast pain, you know, just the classic things we look for. And she did not understand how menopause changes your whole body. And she just didn't understand that this symptom and that symptom and this symptom and that symptom, honey, have you ever read about menopause? She's like, no, I haven't. Or, you know, no, actually what she said is, yes, I read the internet all the time. And I went, then what are, what do you think the symptoms of menopause are? And she's like, hot flashes. Like, but honey, there's so much more than that. Just your anxiety alone, it can, can easily be the result of some of the, some of the menopause going on. So rule, the first task I gave her was I, I gave her an instruction to read an article on menopause so that she could just understand the changes going on in her body. Okay. The second thing that we needed, that she needed to do, in my opinion, is she needed to ask a doctor to look at her skin because they had her on an estrogen insert, but her, but she still had pain been burning as she urinated on her skin, which tells me her skin was not healthy. And so it's like, okay, you need to make an appointment with your, with your doctor and let's get into that doctor, have the doctor look at your skin and let's see if, is it getting better? Or maybe you need more, maybe you need less. I don't know. We can't guess. You shouldn't guess. I shouldn't guess. Let's get a doctor to look at your skin to see if the estrogen you're taking is enough. And honestly, her, you know, when you go through that list of menopause symptoms, she checked, I'm like reading it off. She goes, yes, 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 headaches, yes, this, yes, this, yes, this, yes. Honey, do you realize that those are all symptoms of menopause? What? Yes, they are. Okay, so we needed to get her back into the doctor. Now, the third thing that we had to try to work on is her muscles. And um, she had been to physical therapy, but she did not, and twice, just twice, that's it. That's all she did. She gave up. And so here she's having tremendous movement driven pain. And anytime you move, and that changes your pelvic pain. That's not your bladder. That's your muscles. And she's having a lot of thigh pain. She's having a lot of leg pain. And she went to a neurologist because her primary care said, well, I don't know what's wrong with you. It's a nerve problem. So she goes to a neurologist who does an MRI. Negative. The, no and no ruptured disc in her back, nothing at all like that. It's like, honey, your the your 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 bones and your nervous system appear to be fine, but but she did not understand that her muscles in her pelvis will directly cause some of the symptoms that she was dealing with: pain with sitting that got better when standing, or uh, that tension in your legs, that sciatica-like pain. So anyway, it's a very long discussion. It's like, okay, let's get back to that pelvic floor physical therapist and let's have them check the health of your muscles right now. Because that's the only other thing. Your, ner your nervous system has been ruled out. You have a, and she had a perfectly healthy bladder. Her bladder was healthy. So 
that leads to muscles. And the reason why she stopped the pelvic floor physical therapy is that it hurt. Oh, and she also had symptoms of a prolapse. Renee, thank you for mentioning that. She said, I feel like things are falling out of my body. And I said, did you tell the doctor that? She said, yes. What did the doctor find? Nothing. And I said, did you stand up? Sometimes when you're laying flat on your back, your pro the prolapse goes right back into your body. So the doctor can't see it. But as soon as you stand up, the prolapse starts to fall out. Was she getting infection, Mary? No, I don't believe so. Um, then step number four was, I think, working on anxiety and step number five. Anyway, clear, very clear steps. And I really, these type of patients are the hardest to support because number one, you have to ground yourself in education. If you don't understand how your body works, how are you going to explain it to somebody else? If you don't understand where your muscles are and your nerves are and when your bladder is, you know, we all, the only way to ground yourself is with good basic factual information. And she really didn't have any good information. And I'm like, did you read our website? She's like, well, I'm on the internet. And I'm like, well, what are you reading? You know, um, so we've got to, the way we gain confidence is with knowledge. The way we get effectiveness with our doctors is with knowledge. When we walk into that doctor's appointment, fully informed, fully educated, ready to have a good discussion about treatment options and things like that, it's important. And you can't just walk into the doctor's office and burst into tears and say, I have pain down below. I have burning. I have burning. Help me. I have burning. Okay. That doesn't get you anywhere. What you have to walk in is say, doctor, I have had vaginal burning for six months. It gets worse when I do this. It gets better when I do this. Can you please help me understand what could be causing the symptom? And we really make a mistake when we walk into a doctor's office and expect them to figure it, figure all this out in 10 minutes, five minutes, if you're lucky, five minutes, if you're lucky. I mean, five minutes minimum, 10 minutes, if you're lucky. Um, and so anyway, it's, I, I need you instead to walk in and say, doc, for the last six months, I have not been able to sleep through the night. I'm getting up two, three, four times a night. And what's really strange is that my symptoms get worse when I do this. If I sit in a car, my symptoms get worse. If I have sex, my symptoms get worse. If I drink a cup of coffee, my symptoms get worse. And the devil is in the details here because it's sometimes that little weird random symptom that really confirms the diagnosis. Like for me, feeling a fluttering or a vibration in my pelvic cavity on my left side. And actually it's in my, it's in my left side pelvic floor muscles, probably my obturator muscle. Yeah. I think it's my obturator. Um, and also too, is your pain centered? Is it to the left to center? Is it to the right to center? What makes your pain better? What makes your pain worse? Your symptoms or, or your symptoms better or worse? Um, The other thing that we have to be really clear on is your history. Because a lot of pelvic pain has a foundation in the past, in trauma. So in her case, for example, she'd had three babies, all C-sections, and she'd had two major pelvic surgeries. And she did not understand that all these pelvic traumas over and over and over again are going to create a foundation for pelvic floor tension, probably adhesions, and maybe scar tissue wrapping around her nerves, causing some of her symptoms. Hi, Deborah. If I already, did I already say Deborah? Well, anyway, hi, Deborah. How are you? 
Um, so uh, Renee says, me, she's my twin. <laughs> maybe, maybe. We have, a, we meet a lot of twins. I meet a lot, I, I meet a lot of twins uh, for me, ideally. So if you're feeling completely overwhelmed, break it down into simple sections. Your bladder health, your muscle health, your nerve health, your, uh, if you're struggling with anxiety, we got to, that's on the table. We got to work on that because anytime you're struggling with long-term chronic anxiety, that's going to intensify your pain. That's going to tighten your pelvic floor muscles. So we've got to work on some of that too. And sometimes it's about addressing stuff that happened in the past. I talked about this in our Friday meeting here on Facebook. Um, cause I do drop in meetings on Thursdays or Fridays and face on Facebook. For an hour or two, not a long, not, not a long meeting. And, um, you know, we had a research study that was done up by, by Dr. Ken Peters at our top IC research center is up in Royal Oak, Michigan. And several years ago, he did a study on the incidence of sexual abuse in IC and trauma in IC. And the data was, um, showed that there was a small correlation and certainly not every patient has a history of sexual abuse. I grew up in a fabulous family. I was never sexually abused in my family. Now, I will tell you, in my generation, pretty much all of my friends and I were, you know, were raped. My tennis partner was gang raped. It's terrible. I was rescued from a rapist in Connecticut when I was working back there. She didn't get very far, thank God. So, so sexual abuse is with their childhood sexual abuse okay i'm going i'm not saying this the right way i'm sorry i apologize anyway the point that i'm trying to make here is we were able to establish a correlation between sexual abuse and quote unquote interstitial cystitis it was not a big one it was not a big correlation but it was significantly there and now that we have our subtypes, now that we really understand that. So there is a, um, a classic scenario is a young girl or boy who grew up a victim of sexual abuse as a child. And um, that creates a foundation for long-term muscle tension. That creates a... a um, a uh, foundation for what we call vaginismus muscles so tight that a, a a woman simply has never had normal sex it's always been painful those muscles have been locked down tight because of childhood trauma appropriately so um of course a child's going to do that they don't know what they're doing their body just freezes everything gets tight to protect them when they know they're going to be hurt it is a it is criminal what's happening in the world right now with childhood trauma and the foundation that that creates for a, a long life of trauma and a long life of pain. Um, so we're looking at muscle tension and we're looking at central nervous system dysregulation. We're looking at central sensitization, long-term chronic anxiety disorder, uh, IC, IBS, vulvodynia, TMJ, et cetera, et cetera. And now that we understand that subtype more, we know how to treat it. What we're going to do for patients who do have widespread pain is we're going to go back and look for trauma. We're going to look for physical trauma, like being hit by a car, work with a lot of people who've been hit by cars in childhood, suffered catastrophic injuries, but that small population also of patients who were sexually abused or emotionally abused. And in those contact, in that context, now we can provide much better care without any shame or without any blame. And for the patient, who grows up with all these crazy pain conditions and anxiety disorder. You don't know what the hell's wrong with you. Like, Oh my God, why is this happening to me? Why do I have a bladder issue? Why do I have TMJ? Why do I have migraines? Why do I have irritable bowel syndrome? Why is this happening to me? Why am I being punished? And to be able to give you context and go, it was not your fault. It was never your fault. You have done nothing wrong. There is no shame. There is no blame. This is exactly what we see in patients with central sensitization. There was trauma. And it's okay. 
it'll never happen again. You're not a child again. We can't live. Anyway, I'm, I'm not clearly not saying this exactly the way I say this to patients on the phone. Um, but we're just getting more and more cases now of, of patients who are being, you know, for the first time talking about it. And often they talk about it with me for the first time. And um, I just want to give them a hug and uh, give them a, as much comfort as I can possibly give them and then give them context. This is the connection. So how do we fix it? How do we fix it? We have to calm the central nervous system down. We've got to get you out of fight or flight and we have to uh, deal with the long, you know, deal with the short and long-term consequences of, of that trauma. If, Counseling to ease some of the emotional, the emotional stress and depression and rage and all that. If, if that's a dominant issue, we got to work on that. And we got to work on telling these muscles you're safe. Physical therapy is remarkably helpful. It's restoring good, healthy, normal muscle tone. And then calming that central nervous system to calm the nerves in your bladder so your bladder will get better. Now I've made no secret of my, my childhood. I had a great, I had great parents, but I grew up in a neighborhood with a rapist and a murderer. I did not leave my home without fear from fourth grade through high school. I didn't. I was one of his earliest victims, but he was too young to actually know what to do. But I was terrified for all, all through school until he was finally pulled. And, and ended up in jail. And we have our high school reunions and we have our victim reunions. He hurt so many of us, of the kids my age and the adults my age. And the year I went away to college, he raped and murdered my neighbor. That's why, that's one of the reasons why I struggled with long-term anxiety and multiple pain conditions, including IC. And it is such a oh I, I want to say bitter pill to swallow, but that's not that's not right. It is so wonderful to finally have peace and to finally have the answers and to know that none of this was ever my fault. Everything that happened made total sense. And now that I've calmed my central nervous system and worked on my muscles, all of my symptoms are gone. I don't have IC symptoms. I don't have IBS symptoms. I don't have vulvodynia. I don't have migraines. I still have TMJ, but that's a ligament issue. And if I flare, it's usually because I've tweaked my muscles. So anyway, this is, uh, this is great news. We can, you know, to find those patients who are living alone, confused, frustrated, isolated, in fear, and being able to open that, open a door to them and say, come on out. You're not alone. We're here. And we're going to help whenever we can. I hope that that makes sense. I, I hope that that makes sense. I had, um, I was out all day yesterday and I, um, I'm a little, um, I'm a little slow and tired this morning. <laughs> I am. So anyway, um, getting back to summertime, getting back to summertime. Hey man, get out in the sun. Let's move, babe. Let's move. Try to walk. I need you to walk every day. You don't have to walk far. If you're in your house, walk up and down your hallway. The more you walk, the more you produce natural painkillers and endorphins. The blessing here is that it's summertime and we can't, there's kind of no excuse. Get up and try to move. Um, the more you sit, the more you lay down, the weaker your muscles get and the weaker you get. So if, if for those of you who are really struggling, uh, make sure you're talking to your doctor about it. Make sure you're working with your physical therapist about it and just try to move as much as you can. Uh, I walked twice yesterday. They were short walks, but I was out. Uh, what other, what are the other IC friendly pelvic floor friendly, friendly sports to do in the summer? Um, uh, things to keep your hips level. I need you to keep your hips level. So, um, no running. Okay, no stairmaster. Anything that moves your hips like this, 
it's going to tweak your pelvic floor. I need you to keep your hips level. So if you're going to the gym, you can be on the treadmill. You can do the elliptical. Stay off the Stairmaster. The perfect gym sport if you really want to work out that will completely protect your pelvis and train your body like nothing else is rowing. Rowing. I had to give up. I gave up my gym membership because of COVID. I want to go back now. I, I will probably go back. Rowing is a fantastic exercise. Um, it, uh, bike riding obviously is very dicey, especially on old bikes. But if you happen to have a bike that's been that's been a bike seat that's been modified so that you're you're sitting on the back part of the bike, but nothing is pushing up into your pelvic floor like it's a two bun circle circular seat where you're sitting on two circles but there's no bicycle seat pushing up in between your legs you can get away with that a recumbent bike at the gym you can get away with that swimming should be fine as long as you um get in the shower afterwards don't sit in a wet swimsuit if you're worried about your skin, put a little coating of Vaseline on your on your bits down below to protect your to protect your vulva and stuff from from fluorine. But other than that, I think you should be able to get into the water um, as long as it's a trusted pool. Um, uh, when in doubt, talk to the management. Make sure that they have good that they're maintaining their their pools their pool chemicals well. Um, like they should have a chart of how often they're checking them. They should be checking it every day and doing what they need to do. Uh, the rule is, listen, you don't swim the day that they bomb the pool. Please don't. Wait 24 hours before you go into a fluorinated pool. Some people like um, uh, sea salt pools. I don't have a problem with that either. Just don't sit in that wet swimsuit. Just get out of it as quickly as you can and put on another swimsuit and then go, go lay in the sun if you want to do Mary says, can you do a hot tub? You got to be really careful with the hot tub, especially new hot tubs. Um, I worked with one patient who uh, got a brand new hot tub. They filled it up uh, they put, and they heated it up very, very quickly. Put the chlor first chlorine treatment in it. And literally, she said, can I get in it? And they went, yeah. And that really, the chlorine hadn't had a chance to gas off. And she ended up with a chemical burn on her bed. So you always want to wait 24 to 40, at least 24 hours before you get into a freshly fluorinated pool. Um, um, sailing, uh, getting out on the getting out on the ocean would be great. Uh, getting out onto a lake would be great. Kayaking, canoeing, just just remember that you're more than um your home sometimes we look at our home like a prison i did i still I, I i especially did the last couple of years because i couldn't leave with my parents i mean i hadn't had a night away in seven years so i had a love-hate relationship with this house i love my home i'm this is my safe place but it was also my prison for a long time so i'm i'm trying to get out again and it's good donna here says she dances Eddie says, I started taking natokinase for long COVID. It's helping with the inflammation from the long COVID, but it seems to be irritating my IC. Its main ingredient is soy. Eddie, that's very interesting. Um, you know what you could do, Eddie? Why don't you throw in a pre-leaf? When you take it, I wonder if you can take it with a little bit of calcium or a Tums. Um, and, um, uh, see if that would negate maybe some of the irritation. I don't know if natokinase has acidic properties to it. I really don't know. And I don't know if it's contraindicated. You're going to have to go to the drug safety sheet to see if you're, you can do that or not. There's some medications you cannot take, um, um, uh, an antacid with. So make sure you look at the drug specs before you do that. But that might be an interesting experiment to see if that might help. Mary says, can you have Hunter's lesions and not have IC? No. If you have Hunter's lesions, you have IC in Europe. That's your diagnosis in the United States. Remember, 
interstitial cystitis by its very nature doesn't mean anything. The words don't mean anything. Be a hundred years ago, they thought that interstitial cystitis was a problem with the interstitial layer of the bladder wall. That's been disproven. We've known for 50 years, that's the wrong name. So you can't get hung up in the name. Um, and Europe, they only use the name for patients with Hunter's lesions, but uh, this year there, there's a movement to not use the name interstitial cystitis at all and just call patients with Hunter's lesions, Hunter's lesions patients. And I agree with that. I agree with that. I think the name interstitial cystitis is incorrect. It should be uh, pelvic pain syndrome or bl uh, bladder primary pelvic pain syndrome, prostate primary pelvic pain syndrome, so that we can get, we don't want to do a broad diagnosis. We want to get as narrow and refined as we can. Does that make sense? I hope that that makes sense. So um, the IC network um, is going to have a new name very quickly. It's going to be the IC and pelvic pain network. Hi, Angie. Borea has a cough from COVID. Girl, practice your, you got to practice your kegels. Holy moly, did coughing from COVID mess up my pelvic flu? I mean, I, I was shocked that the coughing was so violent from COVID that I kind of leaked. Uh, Valeria says, could you explain to me why in Europe we cannot buy pre-leaf and even last year's I cannot buy in the USA? It takes several months. Honey, it's a European Union. The European Union is not accepting supplements from America now. Every now and then a few get through, but the vast majority of supplements are refused in your customs and sent back to us. Doesn't matter if it's pre-leaf, it doesn't matter if it's bladder builder, bladder rest, anything at all like that. The only workaround is to have a friend in America or Canada that we can ship it to and and then they can send it to you as a gift. But whenever we have to ship to a European country or the United Kingdom or anywhere else, um, we have to put on the customs form what it is. And as soon as they see the word supplement, it gets rejected and sent back to us. So I can't, we can't change the politics. I, I mean, not politics, we just can't, we can't change, um, their their rules yeah peggy says have someone buy and ship it to you exactly peggy says i've learned so much from you jill and it makes so much sense i have an appointment in august with a guy you're a gynecologist i need help with what to ask should i write a letter and read it to him to keep me from rambling on what would you do peggy um, you just need to prepare for your appointment and over on the IC network website, I actually in the diagnostic area, I have a thing that talks about what you should, you should bring to your first appointment. What I want you to do is I, I want you to make a list of your symptoms, but I need you to be very, very thorough. It's not just, I pee all the time is I, uh, doc, I'm here because I'm trying to understand what's going on with my bladder and or my pelvis. I, um, I am urinating 25 times a day. I am getting up on average two or three times a night or more. Um, my pain is located here. Is your pain inside of your body or outside of your body? Is your pain centered or is it to the left or right or a center? Your bladder is centered. So here's our model, right? So here's your pubic bone. Your bladder is right here. It's right behind your pubic bone. So if you have pain over here or over here, like I once worked, was working with a man who called, his pain was by his right hip bone. <laughs> like, dude, that's not your bladder. Really? No, it's not your bladder was this pelvic floor. So where is your pain located? Is it centered or is it to the left or right as center? Is it shallow or deep? Where do you think the pain is located? Is it in your urethra? Is it in your vagina? Is it in your rectum? Or is it on your skin? You'd be amazed at the number of patients when I ask that question who say it's on their skin or it's in their vagina rather than in their bladder. 
And that, and that applies to men who have rectal pain as compared to bladder pain. But many men struggle with pain at the tip of their penis, which is referred pain from the bladder or the pelvic floor. Um, what makes your pain better? What makes your pain worse? How is your pain when you, how does your pain change throughout the day? Um, is it really bad in the morning? And then does it get better as the day goes on? Or is it better in the morning? And does it get worse as the day goes on? Are there any other weird, unusual symptoms? Like, do you ever feel a painful arousal sensation, which is called PGAD? Well, if you have that, then we know we have a muscle that's compressing nerves. Or do you ever feel like you're carrying a bowling ball around in your pelvis? Do you feel like you're carrying a heavy weight in your pelvis that as the day goes on, gets heavier and heavier and heavier? That then points us to your blood vessels because that's pelvic congestion syndrome. And then what's your history? Do you have a history of uh, previous surgeries? Do you have a history of UTIs? Do you have a history of having babies? Do you have a history of falls? Have you ever been traumatized down there? Have you ever had a fall down there? You should be able to get through all of that just in two or three minutes of discussion, right? You don't want to bring a five page letter. You'll never get through it. You got to bring a list. So come on over to the IC Network website and, and you can find that list. Uh, um, icnetwork.org. Oh, look at that. My, my sign is not showing the whole URL. There we go. There's a cord hanging there too. All righty. Anne says, any good, any good urogynecologist in New Jersey? I recommend that you call the physical therapist and they'll tell you who the good urogynecologists are. Uh, Valeria says, thank you. Very sad. I used to buy from the IT Network supplements in the past. Now it's not possible. Valeria, I, do, I don't know how to get it to you. But if you can, make a friend with somebody in this chat. There's somebody in this chat right now who would, who would probably do it for you. Or you could use a third, you could use a third party packer but they're real sketchy. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But I, I just, I don't know how to get it to you right now. The other thing you could do, Valeria, is just look for a comparable, a comparable supplement in your country. If you can find a, a chondroitin glucosamine supplement, that would be fantastic. That's going to be a really good a match for the critical ingredient that will coat the bladder. So chondroitin glucosamine, uh, add some quercetin in there. Um, so there you've got the triad, the three most important ingredients in a, in a good bladder coating supplement. So the odds are you can kind of recreate the supplement with some with things that you can buy in your country. And if you want some help with that, you just email me. You just email me at icnetwork at mac.com and I can try to give you a list or just look at the ingredients of the supplements that you used to, you used to buy and see if you can find them there. But EU and UK has really put a uh, on our uh, on our business right now. It sucks. Hi, John. Danielle says, what I, I better just what i'd be better just to have my bladder taken out to get rid of the pain no no you know i got i got to tell you the story of one of the when i first started my support group 30 years ago um i had a, a woman in my group who had her bladder removed and it didn't touch her pain at all she was stunned now we know why 
Because for many of us, that pain really isn't coming from our bladder. That frequency urgency is not coming from our bladder. It's coming from our pelvic floor. And to have your bladder removed, you're basically just traumatizing your pelvic floor more. And you're traumatizing the nerves more. Um, if you look at the guidelines, uh, the, the guidelines for IC for the United States, they they put more information about who is a good candidate to have their bladder removed. And basically the best candidates for bladder removes for bladder removal are patients who do not have pelvic floor dysfunction, who do not have signs of nerve involvement and who have, whose bladders have gotten smaller and smaller um, um, uh, and or who are not responding to Hunter's lesion therapy. So the, the, the patients who are now considered good candidates for bladder removal is very, very small because we have a number of patients who have had their bladders removed and it's done nothing for their pain if not made it worse, plus it's kick-ass bad surgery. It is not easy surgery. That's like a year recovery from that surgery. It's really rough, Danielle. So what, you know, instead, I know you're, listen, I asked my doctor three months after I was diagnosed with IC, which would have been um, in early 1993, I asked him to take my bladder out. I said, I don't want it. If this is, the, this is my life, take it out. I don't need it. And thank God he said, no, he said, no, Jill, I'm not taking out your bladder. You haven't done anything yet. You haven't even tried the good treatments yet. We're not taking your bladder out. And I'm so grateful because I don't have those bladder symptoms anymore. And it wouldn't have helped anyway, because I have a perfectly healthy bladder. My problem is neuromuscular, right? Hmm. I know. I know you're, I know you feel exhausted. I, I, girl, I have walked in those shoes. I have been there. Um, if bladder treatments are not working, if they looked in your bladder and you have a healthy bladder, then we've got to look beyond the bladder. We've got to look for other things that could be causing your symptoms because they may be completely curable like pelvic congestion syndrome. So Danielle, do you have any other funky symptoms? What are your dominant symptoms here? What are you struggling with the most? And you guys, hey, for those of you on YouTube, um, I changed the delay from 60 seconds to 20 seconds. Um, we always have to have a posting delay on YouTube because people crash YouTube. So you should be able to type more frequently. Now, the other thing we can do is we can open up a Zoom meeting if anybody would like to Zoom and ask their questions directly. Now, um, Kayleen, I, I swear I, I thought I saw you write something, but it's not letting me scroll back and see it. I am sorry. That's Facebook for you. Yep. Yes, what, Peggy? Yes, what? Hey, by the way, have you guys seen the new Waterloo um, sparkling waters? Wow, they're good. I, I have the peach and I just got the watermelon. Peggy wants to do Zoom. Okay. Um, this is this is a little bit of tart cherry juice. And when I mean a little bit, it's like this amount, just enough to give it color in a watermelon um, sparkling water. And you know what? It's good. It's really, really good. All right, guys, you got to give me questions. Anybody have any questions that I can help you with?
one. Danielle says, my symptoms are deep under the vaginal perineal area. area. As I walk, it feels so heavy and I get very achy and I have to take a methadone at night to cut the pain down to a bare minimum. Okay, I want to show you something, hon. Hold on. So, so that makes me think of two things, okay? So that sensation of heaviness. If, if you wake up in the morning and you're kind of okay, but as the day goes on, you get heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier until by the end of the day, you just literally don't want to walk um, or walking is really uncomfortable. We know what that is. That is pelvic congestion syndrome. That is, that means that you have a swollen vein in your pelvis or artery in your pelvis that's collecting blood and that is treatable. That's completely treatable. It takes an inter interventional radiologist to treat. Okay, so that concept number one is the heaviness. Because the bladder does not cause a heavy sensation. Blood vessels cause a heavy sensation. But, you know, when I was in high school and struggling with vulvodynia, um, and guys, it was bad. I, I mean, I felt like I had a yeast infection every day and I'd be crying and going to my doctor over and over and over. And it was always the worst, right? Exactly where your pain is the worst, which is your perineum, deep in the vaginal perineal area. And so I want to show you something here. I want you, okay. Let's see here. The more you walk, the more it hurts. Okay, so hold on. So just hold on tight. Okay. I want you to look at this picture. And it, ignore ignore that. I'm just covering up another picture we don't have to look at. Okay. So here's your rectum. Here's your vagina. Do you see this little round thing right there? You see that little round thing? That is called the perineal body. It is an attachment point for a bunch of muscles. Um, and so the reason why, so Dr. Weiss in this book talks about perineal pain and that perineal pain is often muscle pain. Um, let's see. I want to. Let me see if I can find another picture that's. It's hard to find pictures that, that are clear enough and big enough that I can show you over a video monitor. That's the challenge. Mm. Um, you know, I fixed my, ah, here we go. I glued back together my Levator Ani model that broke. So again, let's go back to our model here for a moment. Hip bone, hip bone, pubic bone. 
And if we turn it underneath, you can see that your pelvic floor muscles basically hold, hold your structures in place, okay? So we have deeper muscles and we have shallow muscles. So let's put on the shallowest muscles, which are your levator ani muscles. Okay. And now with this, we can see your urethra up here, your vagina right here, and your rectum right here. Hello here. This is your perineum. This is what's directly underneath your perineum right here. Is this levator ani muscle? So I'm gonna, I would like to know have you had a pelvic floor assessment? And let's see what's going on with your pelvic floor. Danielle said, I was also told that you had bacterial vaginosis and yeast, in yeast infection at the same time, and the doctor left. So I still don't know whether I had those issues on top of my other issues. Pelvic floor dysfunction causes all the symptoms that you would associate with yeast. The only thing it doesn't cause is a discharge. And all that time that I thought I had yeast infections over and over and over and over again, I never really had discharge. So don't be surprised if these muscles all correlate with tight pelvic floor muscles. Uh, Renee says, what are the three supplements again? Glucosamine, chondroitin, and quercetin and the chondroitin is the most one and you never double triple or quadruple anything don't start taking all the supplements at the same time yeah you should you need to pick one and stay with one so i had a patient call who was taking glucosamine and chondroitin from a, another manufacturer for her arthritis her doctor put her on a full dose, just plain glucosamine on top of that. Then she started one of the bladder supplements and she ended up with high blood pressure because she was taking way too much and glucosamine can cause high blood pressure, higher, higher blood pressure when taken in quantity. So it's like back off, more is not better. Peggy said, I started Pure and Systemin five days ago. I wanted to work so bad trying to be positive. Yeah, I, girl, you got, you just got to give things a try. Mary says, do you have cheat sheets or small cards with dietary restrictions? Yes, I do, as a matter of fact. Uh, let's see if we can find one. Here you go. This is one of our diet cards. Usually bladder friendly. Foods to avoid. You can buy this in the IC Network shop. It's like three for $2.99. We also have restroom access cards in the IC Network shop you can get. And if you become a member, you, uh, you get, I think you get both of them free anyway. Marlia says, I have IBS symptoms and ter terrible gas often. No way could I do sparkling water, Jill. But I just started Heather's IBS powder. Do you think this will help at some point? It certainly helped me, hon. Uh, and the IBS um, a, a fiber, acacia fiber. Do you think this will help at some point? I'm totally going to stop gluten and dairy, hoping I can get out of the belly bloat and gas pains, trying desperately to find the fine line between constipation and diarrhea. Um, um, it's always going to be a process of elimination. So important first to differentiate between belching and farting. If you're belching a lot, then that means that food is fermenting in your stomach. Food is sitting in your stomach for a long period of time. Um, or that's where sparkling water would be very, I didn't drink sparkling water for a long time. And there are times when I still don't drink sparkling water. It depends on how I feel and how my stomach feels. Um, so if we have a lot of gas in your stomach, that's very different than gas from farting. Um, so, um, that's just, there's a lot of nuance in trying to find the, the combination of foods that will work for, for us individually. And that takes a really good elimination diet. 
Heather Von Voris's website, Help for IBS, has excellent tips on food. Um, one of the things that she taught me when she appeared in one of our IC Network guest lectures is that just as the nerves in the bladder are sensitive, the nerves in the bowel are sensitive. And so it's very important that we eat foods that are easy to digest rather than hard to digest. So an example of a food which will irritate nerves extensively is granola, foods that are hard with sharp edges. Remembering that the nerves in your bowel are super sensitive and here you're eating something with rough edges and if that food is going down your bowel, it's basically scratching and tweaking and irritating your the skin on the inside of your bowel. Um, also, um, uh, lettuce, green, leafy greens. Leafy greens actually are, have very sharp edges. Even though they're kind of soft when you chew them up and you would think that here you've chewed them, they would be soft. Leafy greens are notorious for trigger, triggering IBS attack. I had many, many IBS attacks after eating salads for, for lunch or dinner, including on dates. It's terrible. Um, so what she said is don't start your meal with a leafy green end your meal with a leafy green that ultimately at every meal you just have to remember that the nerves in your bowel are very sensitive so the first thing that goes in there should be soothing like rice or potatoes or a roll rather than starting a meal with a salad um and and i eat tons of salad i honestly but i don't eat i i do not eat leafy greens because I have gastroparesis. That means the nerves in my stomach are sensitive. So I deliberately try to eat foods that will be easier for my body to digest. Um, what is the website with the IBS tips? Um, Helpforibs.com. We all got started. Uh, Heather and I and the lady who started History Sisters, uh, we all got started at exactly the same time. and. and so Kathy ran the hysterectomy support group, Heather ran the IBS support group, I ran the IC support group, and we were all the first on the internet for what we did. Um, and it's interesting how we differed, how we changed as we went on, because uh, Heather created a fabulous product line that I use myself. Uh, she had an idea about a soluble fiber, and she did it, and she created her acacia fiber. Uh, Kathy, uh, really went all in on internet support and put a ton of money in building her website and building a support forum. I did the same, but I did a lot of research. I was more of an academic. And so I wanted to contribute more to IC research. And we all made our choices and it is what it is. Uh, Renee says, good idea. Don't they serve salad last in Europe? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Danielle says, oh, my God, that makes total sense. Why the methadone is working. Tylenol and Advil doesn't do anything. I was told by the specialist I had pelvic floor disorder, but was never told what to do about it. Danielle, what? You need a proper pelvic floor assessment. We need to figure out what's going on with your muscles. If you have tight muscles, and if somebody told you that you had pelvic floor disorder or pelvic floor dysfunction, you should have been referred immediately to a physical therapist. I don't understand how that did not happen. That's really frustrating. It's got to be very frustrating for you because that's treatable. And pelvic floor physical therapy is stunningly successful at reducing the symptoms of IC, and we have the research to prove it. We also now know from yet another research study done by our National Institutes of Health that that dominant symptom of frequency urgency is most commonly associated with tight pelvic floor muscles as compared to with bladder issue, which is fascinating. Made to, you know, I mean, it's so weird because you have all the symptoms of a bladder infection. You're going bladder infection, bladder infection. The culture comes back negative. They look in your bladder. You got a good healthy bladder. Well, the doctor says, I don't know what's wrong with you. And okay, well, muscles. Now we have to look at muscles. Michelle said, my doctor is recommending ovary removal for pelvic congestion syndrome. I had a hysterectomy in 2021 and, and you're 48. How would ovary removal help a, help a swollen blood vessel? 
unless it is a blood vessel that also supports that ovary. There is, there is one specific artery or vein that is most commonly associated with pelvic congestion syndrome. So, so maybe, maybe there's a physical structural relationship between that. The challenge with having your ovaries removed is that, um, yeah, Renee says no, unless you have a severe situation. When you need those, it, it, you, you don't want to go into early menopause. I, honey, I don't know how old you are. I can't tell how old you are from your picture. But having your ovary removes, removed in your 20s or 30s will put you into a very, very early menopause. And that's just not good. If there's any way to save the ovary, we want to try to save the ovary so that you can have a natural progression. Sandra, thank you so much for the 200 stars. Sandra says, I was diagnosed with IC in March, had a cystoscopy, which is fine. Doctor said I might have pelvic floor dysfunction. Be seeing a physical therapist and it's helping. Yeah, baby. My muscles are very tight, just like mine were. My question is, if it's muscle or nerve problem, why would diet make a difference? I will tell you exactly what happens. So here's the issue. When you think about tight pelvic floor muscles here, what you don't see in this model are all the blood vessels. Okay. So in this model, you, we have nerves that come off of the sacrum that go through the muscles, but we also have ginormous blood vessels like your femoral artery that also go through your pelvic cavity. And the problem is, is that if your muscles are tight, they squeeze blood vessels and they restrict blood supply. This is called ischemia, I-S-C-H-E-M-I-A, ischemia. So if your bladder is supposed to get 24 units of blood a day and it's only getting 10, are you going to have a healthy bladder? The answer is no, you will not because your bladder is not getting the oxygenation and the nutrition it needs to have a good healthy bladder wall. Just not. And so the bladder wall is now compromised and more diet sensitive. So the, this is this is what I call the chicken versus the egg dilemma. Which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And for us, it's which comes first, the bladder or the pelvic floor? They're both involved. They cannot not both be involved. They are too interconnected. So for some patients, it begins with a bladder issue like chemotherapy. You're drinking way too much diet soda or having an infection. Your bladder screaming in pain and your muscles get tight and a guarding reflex to protect you from that pain. Our therapeutic priority for that patient is to figure out what's irritating the heck out of the bladder, calm and soothe the bladder, and hope that, hope that the muscles are released. But that's the small part of, the, of, this, of this conundrum. For far more patients, it begins with a muscle problem. But you don't know you have a muscle problem. Let's just say you, you've had a couple of babies. You've had a C-section. You had a big baby. You've fallen on your tailbone. You were a bike rider. You, you had multiple traumas for one reason or another in the pelvis. And, you know, it was a fall. You thought you got better, but what you didn't know is there was a legacy to that trauma. And the legacy to the, every time you fall or, or you hurt your, your muscles, you usually develop latent trigger points. It's a silent trigger point. The muscle's injured. You just don't know it's injured because it's not giving you symptoms. And the latent trigger points build and build and build and build. And then finally, the one tiny little event, something completely innocuous, is it's a straw that broke the camel's back and bam, your pelvic floor is tight and giving you symptoms. But your symptoms are frequency urgency. You think you have a UTI, you call the doctor, they give you antibiotics, they don't work. You go back to the doctor. The doctor goes, let's try overactive bladder meds. They don't work. Eventually you get the IC diagnosis. Hate to break it to you, you got an incurable bladder disease. You're grateful to have a name. You're desperate to get better. You do everything they tell you to do. You take the antidepressants, you take the Elmrods, you take the antihistamines, you change your diet for a year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, but you're still flaring. 
Why? Because for this patient, it's not the bladder, it's poor blood supply from tight muscles. And our therapeutic priority is to restore blood supply. The way we re restore blood supply is with pelvic floor physical therapy. And what research shows is that pelvic floor physical therapy outperforms bladder wall treatments two or three to one. Easy. Easy. She, Sandra says, that makes sense. Mine started with the UTI, did have a big baby. You also have vaginal atrophy. So the atrophy also is going to be affecting, affecting uh, your bladder wall, the integrity of your bladder wall and your urethra also. But usually, so I mean, the, the typical sequence of events is some childhood trauma, injury, falling on tailbone, having babies. You have no freaking clue. You have a muscle injury. Then at some point in time, you get the bladder symptoms. You think it's UTI for years and years and years. It's not UTI. You get the diagnosis. Maybe you get physical therapy. Maybe things get better. And then, bam, menopause happens. And as those estrogen levels drop, that also is going to affect the integrity of the bladder wall and the integrity of the, the vagina and the vulva. All those, skin, all, all those structures need mucus. Mucus provides a protective effect. So your bladder is wet on the inside, just like your mouth is wet on the inside. That thick coating of mucus protects all that tissue. Unfortunately, it's estrogen dependent. So when you're young and have lots of estrogen, you're gold. You have your ovaries taken out, don't have the estrogen anymore. You get older, you don't have the estrogen anymore. And so that nice thick coating diminishes. Thus, your bladder's ability to protect itself is now compromised. Now you start getting diet sensitive. And so for many patients get very confused because they get their symptoms under control in their 30s and 40s, and then bam, they come back in their 50s. They're terrified. Oh my God, it's back. And they just don't understand that, no, that's just estrogen loss. And, and so we know what to do about that. We're going to do something that's going to have a bit of a coating effect. And that's where diet really matters. You know, if you, Sandra, you're 61. Girl, I'll be 63 on Wednesday. You've been on estrogen cream since February. Good. Keep it up. Keep it up. It's just so weird. You know, you got you got to understand. It doesn't matter how old you are, you feel young. I feel 25. Well, no, I, I no, I'm gonna say I feel 30 right now because I've just the stress of the last couple of months have been off, off, been awful. But honestly, I feel so young that it's baffling to actually have kind of an age-related thing going on. The estrogen thing is real. John says, do I have a lubricant recommendation better than water-based for internal therapy? Um, 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 uh, well, I'm a KY girl. I do per perfectly fine with KY myself. So that's what I use when I do my internal work. Um, there are a couple of others. Um, oh, you guys, I have grief brain right now. Just so you understand my memory is, has been my brain, ev my brain and my memory are not normal. They're traumatized. I think the stress of losing my parents is kind of like a, a brain injury in a way. I think that's a good way of looking at it, actually. Um, and so it's very normal to have memory issues when, when you're going through intense grief like I am. Um, so hold on a sec. Let me, uh, let me, let me, uh, let me go to Amazon for a moment. Uh, the slip, slippery stuff slippery stuff. I don't know if they still make that. That was very popular. Yeah, yeah, they do. So slippery stuff, personal lubricant gel would be the other choice. Um, Astroglide. Yeah, 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 yeah. Slippery stuff would be the other option. I would say KY, 
or slippery stuff. Some people use use aloe. I don't know, you know, a, a very, very refined aloe gel. That's also possible too. Uh, Angie said, I've developed what they think is muscle atrophy in my legs and feet. My orthopedic doctor asked if I had it any other place. How would I know? Or is it possible to have it in my pelvic muscles? How could they tell? A physical therapist would tell. I have, when I ruptured uh, the uh, disc in my back two years ago, um, I developed um, above my right knee. It feels like there's a tight leather belt every day. Like literally the first thing that I put on in the morning is a knee brace. And as long as I compress this area above my knee, I'm fine. If I take this off, I have, it's so weird. It's so weird. And so, um, they told me that that nerve injury would cause atrophy in that leg. And that leg is a, a, a little tiny bit, but it's, it's being compressed by the brace. So uh, I think a physical therapist would be the one that you'd have to ask about that. That's a, that's a sucky part about getting old or these freaking injuries. Oh, so annoying. Like I, I want to, I want to play, ten, I want to go play tennis again. I played, I was a huge tennis player when I was younger. I was ranked, I was ranked in California. I was number one on my college tennis team. I loved, I, I, my rackets are hanging. My rackets are hanging in the hallway. I just found them. I have all my trophies. Like I'm, I want to go play tennis again, but I'm not sure what my, you know, I used to be the pro and I got to go pay a pro to play with. <laughs> we'll see. I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to give it a try this summer. Go hit some balls. See, see how I do with that. All right. Let's see what's going on over here on, on YouTube. Danielle says, I too have vaginal estrophy, but you, the vaginal estrogen helps a little bit. The vaginal estrogen is the single most important thing. Because when you give that skin estrogen, it produces mucus. Renee says, can you do it with the brace, a special sports brace? Uh, well, the brace I'm wearing would be fine. I just don't understand the mechanics of what happened with the nerve injury. I mean, I was during an evacuation. I My dad refused to leave during a fire. It's a fire is coming down the hill towards the house. And I had to uh, carry a gun case up up. Uh, flight of stairs. And that's when, that's when I ruptured just in my back. And that's the, that's a, that's a trauma of, of these crazy firestorms is adrenaline makes you do things you should not do. So, but I also stumbled I was, I was carrying it out my back door and I landed on my right leg and my leg gave out. Um, and so I still feel like I have a knee injury or I have a fascia injury. I like, I think it's a fascia industry around my, th around my thigh. I don't know. And, and I'm in Kaiser Permanente and they're not exactly uh, proactive. They're just saying, you want an MRI? You want an MRI? It's like, no, I've had MRIs. We know what's going on. I want you to look at my freaking thigh. Touch it. <laughs> it's so crazy. It's so crazy when you go to a physical therapist and like they don't want to touch you. <laughs> it's like, guys, yeah. I have a tight neck. Feel, touch it. It's crazy. It's crazy kind of what's happening in healthcare right now. Mary says, why wouldn't E-string work? I think there must be more to it. Well, so E-string is, um, is, is another way of delivering estrogen into the vagina that's not messy. It's a time-release little round. Um, it's, not, it's not a rubber band, but it looks like a rubber band, but it's kind of stiff, maybe the size of a quarter, maybe a little bit bigger than a quarter. 
more like a half dollar size. Um, some people like it. Some people don't like it. Uh, I never liked it. It kept falling out. I, you know, and they say, if it falls out, wash it up and put it back up there. And I'm like, I don't know if I really want to do that. So I didn't, I didn't really like the E-string myself. I really like the cream because you can put the cream wherever you need it. And I tend to use my estrogen cream more by my urethra on the outside than I do on the inside. Mary says, I went to physical therapy five times. They didn't want to touch me after I told them the pain I was in. Left out loud, it was great. I know, right? And the thing is, is you as a patient can't be afraid of the pain. You want them to touch you to find the pain. You know? And Mary says here, I like the E-string. There's no problem. It just didn't work for my bladder at all. Well, but Mary, it's not going to work for your bladder. You got to have a reality check on what you're trying to accomplish with est any estrogen therapy down there. It's not for your bladder. It's for, it's not going to change your bladder symptoms right away. What it's going to do is improve the quality and health of your skin. Um, let's see here. Danielle says Astroglide has glycerin in it and may last a little bit longer for lubrication. Okay. And you've really got to stay away from products that provide a heating effect or a cooling effect. Like if you're a KY girl, like I am, you just do the plain KY. You don't get the, the heat or cool part of it. Mary says, I thought estrogen was for the bladder too. It's for any mucous membrane. So it will help the bladder wall. It will have genitourinary syndrome of menopause, but it doesn't necessarily turn off frequency urgency pain right away. Mary says, a phys physical therapist insisted on a phone appointment before they'd see me. I have Kaiser as well. Yeah, I, I was just talking about that yesterday with a really good friend of mine who's a uh, who works at Kaiser. Um, Kaiser, for those of you on the East Coast, is a big um, HMO here on the West Coast. And they're, they, they have been, they've been around for, I don't know, like 60 years or so. And they've been very, very good. I mean, they saved my life twice. I had surgery there. I have no regrets about the surger, surgical care I received at Kaiser at all. Um, I had my uter my hyster hysterectomy for uterine cancer there. I'm I, I, yeah, that was great. But they are, every health organization right now is devastated by the after effects of COVID because healthcare providers are leaving, have left. And here, a lot of healthcare providers moved away because of the fires. And so they're like 50% staffed. They don't have the staff anymore. And so trying to get an appointment, it, it it's it's like Canada or England. It's it's like months out now to try to get an appointment. And the, and they and and then we also have to deal with the double whammy of the fact that fewer fewer students are actually going into healthcare because they don't want to take on the debt. It is so ridiculous how much college and medical school costs now. Would you willingly accrue a $200,000 debt, you know, to become a doctor, knowing that you might not pay that off in your entire career, depending upon what specialty you pick? I mean, if you're a flashy orthopedic surgeon or a plastic surgeon, yeah, you'll probably pay it off in 10 years. But if you're if you're a primary care provider or an OBGYN, you're not in the big buck field in doctor. You're just not, and so you, you, your ability to pay that off will be greatly compromised. So, medical schools specialists are uh, medical schools are having a hard time finding students, and and as she said to me yesterday, uh, they just can't find the doctors. They know they need doctors. They're recruiting for doctors. They can't get them. They're not applying. I made an appointment to get my, uh, I, I broke my reading glasses. I have one eye nearsight, nearsighted and one eye farsighted. So my eyes are crazy. And um, uh, so I called, what, a week ago, two weeks ago? The latest appointment was at the end of August for a prescription that would take a 10-minute exam. 
And they promised me, my optometrist promised me I wouldn't have to wait more than a week. Well, she's gone. And now they just, they don't have, they don't have the appointment. So now I'm going to have to go to Costco, you know, or some other eye place to get my eye exam. And I told Kaiser, are you guys going to pay for that since you can't do it? It's crazy kind of what's happening right now. Danielle says you can't have the ring because you had a hysterectomy. Yeah. I didn't even really think of that. You know, Danielle, you know, for those of us who have had um, laparoscopic assisted total vaginal hysterectomy, um, basically what they do is you they use um, cameras and instruments through some small incisions in the belly, but then they pull everything out through the vagina and that usually includes a cervix. And so you you end up with, um, at least for me, that tissue up where my cervix used to be that they sutured shut, really sensitive. Hello, Sheila. Welcome. Sheila's new here. My story is very lengthy and I would like to send it to you. Do you do that? I'm sick since you had a C-section. Uh, sure. You can do that. I can give you my email. Um, uh, uh, we can go into a Zoom if you you guys. We, I'm, I'm happy to open up a Zoom if you guys want to transition into a Zoom meeting. Uh, my email address is really easy. It's icnetwork at mac.com. So icnetwork at M is in Mary, A is in Apple, C is in Charlie.com. Or you can just give a phone call. I answer the patient um, education line and the corporate line. Sheila, lost my place. July 4th, 1982. You're 79. Many, uh, many diagnoses. And, and Sheila, you have to be in extreme estrogen atrophy now. Extreme. Hi, Loretta. Trigger point injections were a big help to me. It made things a lot easier for my physical therapy. Excellent. That's what I love to hear. Donna says, Zoom is great. Please participate. You know, my, my muscles and my shoulders are very tender today. They've been tender for about a, for a couple of days. Like, what did I do? I need to get some Tiger Balm and put it on my shoulders. Uh, I see network at Mac.com. Danielle, on the East Coast, the doctors are walking out as well. I literally waited four months to have a doctor to have him leave. A month and a half later, happened to me the three different doctors. Yeah, I've lost three, three primary care providers in in five years at Kaiser and the first one was my favorite it was a he was a, a man I just loved him and um I ran into him and asked him why he left and he said they took the fun out of it they left Kaiser because Kaiser is obsessed with meeting they just keep having their doctors and all their staff do meeting after meeting after meeting and they don't get time, but they still have work to do. So if you're in meetings for 10 hours a month, you've got 10 hours you got to take out of your own time to do, do the work that you missed because of the damn meeting. Loretta, you've been MIA. Oh, honey, nice to see you again. Mary says, if you're in extreme atrophy, can it be reversed? Well, you're never going to have a 20-year-old skin again, but estrogen will certainly help that skin tremendously. Because the loss of estrogen is why that skin has become so so dry and brittle. And what they have shown, you can watch the skin on an electron microscope. When you put estrogen on it, it immediately starts to plump up and produce mucus. So topical estrogen, estrogen cream is considered very safe. Uh, Sandra says, been doing my exercises faithfully, but my muscles are still tight. Well, maybe you're doing the wrong exercises or the most important question to ask a physical therapist is, 
um, are my muscles slowly improving over time or are they just getting, are they just always locking back down into tension? If they're always locking back down into tension, then we have to look beyond the muscles at the bones. Do we have a bad SI joint, a bad hip, a bad knee, a bad foot? Are you walking incorrectly, whatever? So if muscles are always locking back down into pelvic floor tension, we've got to look at that. Mary says she's confused. Is estrogen for the vagina? No, it helps the vagina. It helps the vulva. It helps the urethra and it helps the bladder. It will improve the skin. But it's not a treatment for frequency urgency. So some women start using estrogen and they stop it a couple of weeks later because they go, well, my IT is not any better. Why should I do it? And you can't look at it that way. This is about making the skin healthy and strong over time. If you don't do the estrogen, your skin is just going to get drier and drier and drier. Sheila says she's not able to zoom. Okay, not a problem. Not a problem. Hold on, I've got a, a weird message on this computer. Really? Okay, it's gone. Mary Mary says, why are they giving us estrogen for IC then? They're not giving it to you for IC. They're giving it to you for genitourinary syndrome of menopause. We have to get the skin healthy inside and outside. Estrogen will do that. Listen, Mary, I've worked with some ladies in their 80s. Their vulvas are like dry potato chips and they're, they are in agony. The skin is meant to be moist. The moisture, the mucus plays a very important role in the health of our mouth. Think about how painful dry mouth is. When you have dry mouth, you're sipping water all the time. Well, dry vulva, dry urethra, dry bladder is just as painful. And so we want to make sure we want to give you a foundation for good bladder health. And, and good vulvar health and good vaginal health. And that means that that skin is moist, that it has mucus. Uh, Mary says, you, I know, but that's been what they would have told me would help. You have no vaginal pain, only bladder. Well, it will help. It will help bladder health. It will. But we want to make sure we haven't missed something else at the same time. But again, if your vulva is dry and your vagina is dry, so is your urethra, so is your bladder. We've got to get that skin healthy. Now, if you have more additional, so, so as it, let me, Mary, let me just play devil's advocate here because I was working with somebody last week who was in her 70s. And um, she was peeing uh, 30 times a day. Really, I mean, she was in deep distress. Her symptoms were dominating her life. And she was doing estrogen. She was doing estrogen. And anytime we see somebody with that really severe nighttime urination, I, I always go to look for what happened during the day, which poked the bladder, right? Because to me, that means that there's something on a daily basis, which is absolutely provoking the bladder wall. And so we went back and I said, all right, how's your diet? And um, uh, she was drinking one cup of coffee a day which is not good if you're in estrogen atrophy, right? And she was, God, what? I, I talked to so many patients. I, I don't, I, I try not to mix them up. Um, she was taking either a multivitamin or an I formula vitamin. And it was not a proper low acid vitamin. And, and she did not understand that she was putting acid in her bladder a couple of times a day and not a little bit. It was, it was more a lot. There was something else, something else that she was doing. And so 
if you're if you're pro, if you're poking and prodding your bladder with acid every day, no treatment's going to work. If you're washing your bladder in acid all day every day, or alkaline water, which is just as bad, um, you you're, you 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 are getting in the way of healing. It is physically impossible for your bladder to repair itself if you're pouring acid on it every day. Every time you drink that cup of coffee, you set yourself two weeks back worth of tissue healing. And so for her, her even though she was doing everything right with the estrogen, she was sabotaging everything with her diet. Sandra says, my doctor suggested Botox. I'm afraid of it because I... I can't self-catheterize. You also have Hunter's lesions. If you can't self-catheterize, you are not a candidate for Botox, son. You might be a candidate for a Botox installation, but certainly not Botox shots. Uh, the number one rule of the FDA label is, is you must be able to self-catheterize if to be considered for Botox therapy. Botox is also not a treatment for Hunter's lesions. So to me, that's that's off the table for you. Let me go get some Tiger Balm. Hold on. I'll be right back. Oh, I'm stiff from sitting. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Tiger Bomb before. Trying to get my camera to focus. This is um, this is not for intimate use. You do not put this between your legs. It is like um, it's like um, tropical Vicks vapor rub. And if you can rub it on muscles and it will, it can really help. Like my shoulder is just not happy right now. Earlier it was my left shoulder. Now it's my right shoulder. Ah, but it's quite fragrant. Um, and you can't, you don't really want it under your nose. Like, I like the smell, so the smell wouldn't bother me, but um, I'll put a little bit on my neck here, too. Oh, okay, but, okay, hold on. Whoops. I don't want my hair to have tiger ball in it. Ah, darn it. I did not plan this well. Hold on. Now I got to go wash my hand. Hold on. <laughs> I'll be right back. I got to wash my hand. Okay, going for the neck was a poor hair choice. Woo, that's fragrant. I mean, I like the smell, but I like, I also like Vicks Vapor Red. But it is pungent. It is very, very pungent. Sheila says, I need to see a therapist. Oh, see, even my glasses are. Hold on. Ah, life. Okay, I need to see. Oh, come on. Oh, my God. See, now I got it on my freaking glasses. 
Let me try a different pair of glasses. Okay. Uh, so you need, you need to, Sheila says she needs to see a therapist or practitioner of Palm Beach County. I live in Boynton Beach. Um, there's a great website, pelvicrehab.com. Pelvicrehab.com. Go there, put in your zip code, and uh, you'll find a therapist. So let me go ahead and start up a Zoom meeting, okay? And for anybody who wants to come on into Zoom and hang out for a little bit and just say hi to each other and support and encourage each other, why not? Let's do it. So give me a moment and I will set up a Zoom. Now, the thing about Zoom is that I'm going to leave Facebook and uh, YouTube open. Um, so they're going to hear you. They're not going to see you, but they're going to hear you. Um, and so if you want to talk privately with me and you don't want other people to hear, then we'll do that offline. You can do that offline this week. I do coaching all the time with patients. So hold on. Zoom is updating. Oh, wait, did I mess my earring up too? I did. All right, hold on a sec. It's opening. All right, I'm starting up the Zoom right now. Yes, updated terms of service. Okay. All right. All right, so let me, so here on Facebook, I'm going to give you the Zoom invite. If anybody wants to come in, that's fine. If not, that's okay. And YouTube, hold on one sec. Give me a minute. I got to transfer the link to my YouTube computer. So you guys, Mondays are kind of my day off. So I usually don't take a lot of phone calls on Mondays, just so you know. Hi, Deb. I'm okay, hon. I'm okay. I'm getting better. I'm getting better with time. I just am a, I'm just learning a lot about grief, but. I love being a beginner. You know, I, I, I like not being the expert because you have to. It's nice to be able to sit at the back of the room and with, learn with everybody else. But grief isn't quite that easy. Grief just hits you in the face and doesn't let you go. All right. So YouTube, you guys have the link. Facebook, you guys have the link. If anybody wants to come into YouTube, feel free. We've got two that are waiting right now. Wait, hold on. Well, I thought two were waiting. All right. If you're trying to get into Zoom, come on back. I don't know what happened there. And if not, that's okay. What is going on with my earrings? I have one. My earrings were fine. And now one is longer than the other. They're the same. No, they're not the same. Oh, what is going on with my earrings?
All righty. No takers. All right, I'll shut it down. I'm going to shut it down. All right, my friends. Well, listen, I think we've come to uh, last call for questions, last call for questions. Otherwise, I think uh, uh, we should all get out and enjoy the rest of this beautiful sunny day. Last call for questions. Last call for questions. Sorry, I was a little fuzzy today. It's what it is. All righty. I think we'll just go ahead and call it. You guys, I wish you a great week. Come on over to the IC Network website when you can. Sign up for our free newsletter. I'll be sending out a newsletter this week. We have a lot of new news coming up. If you find these meetings helpful, please uh, click that subscribe button. Click the bell so you get notified when we go live. And I absolutely wish you the best. I hope you have a fantastic week. And I will see you again. Uh, next weekend. All right. All right, YouTube. I'll see you guys later.